Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27, Voyage to Rome, Shipwreck on Malta. Voyage to Rome, AD 60. Psalm 107, verse 23 to 31, says, They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth, and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro like a drunken man, and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. O oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. All this was Paul's own experience, for he wrote, Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. Was he washed overboard in a storm? In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils in the sea. This he wrote in the second of Corinthians chapter 11 verses 25 to 26. And since Paul's second epistle to Corinth was written from Macedonia about AD 57, he had actually suffered four shipwrecks by the time he reached Rome. Acts 27 verses 1 to 13 Sailing against the wind Three great lessons come out of Paul's experiences on this disastrous voyage to Rome where everything seemed to be against Paul despite the fact that his Lord had said that he must testify in Rome. These lessons are of providence, faith, and allegory. But let us first look at Luke's remarkable account of their adventures. It was determined that we should sail into Italy, Luke says. Prisoners, and there were a number on board, were not allowed to be accompanied by family or friends. There is one famous case where even the wife of a Roman noble was not allowed to accompany her husband and she had to hire a boat to follow him. Sir William Ramsay mentions this in Pictures of the Apostolic Church. It is probable that Julius, a centurion of the Sebastos, authorised version Augustus, band, had been present at Paul's hearing and was aware of his innocence and of his Roman citizenship. He and his band of soldiers may well have been the escort for Porcius Festus, who were now returning to Rome. It is also possible that Luke records Julius' name because he later became a brother in Christ. Refer to Philippians 1 verses 12 to 14. Certainly Paul was treated quite differently to the other prisoners, who were almost certainly criminals destined to be killed in the Roman arena for the amusement of the populace. Luke most likely travelled as Paul's slave or as ship's doctor. There was also Aristarchus of Thessalonica with them. Aristarchus had been rushed into the theatre in Ephesus and was one of the delegates who had travelled to Jerusalem with Paul, mentioned in Acts 19, verse 29 and 20, verse 4. He had stayed on for two years that Paul had been imprisoned and travelled either as a passenger on this ship or perhaps registered as Paul's slave, for up to two slaves were permitted to accompany important Roman prisoners. In Rome, Aristarchus was to be imprisoned for the gospel. We find this in Colossians 4 verse 10 and Philemon verse 24. These brethren gave their lives to Paul as he to Christ. They also are wonderful examples to us of unselfish and loving dedication. 
Festus had probably reached Judea in early summer. It was now autumn, and the sailing season for long open sea voyages would soon be closed because of the winter storms which would make it too dangerous. The non-sailing period, due to fogs and winter storms, lasted from about November the 10th until March the 5th. But sailing across the Mediterranean was considered to be risky from mid-September. Since the prevailing winds were westerlies, sailing to the east was swift. The difficulty came on the return journey, which required tacking against the wind and was consequently very slow. The alternative was the more arduous overland route which Centurion Julius preferred to avoid. So, probably at Ptolemaeus, the party boarded a cargo ship from Adramitium, meaning House of Death, on the west coast of Asia Minor, possibly intending to finish the journey from Asia by the overland route, for it was now towards the end of August, AD 60. As the ship sailed, Paul saw the promised land that he loved, for the last time. It would have been an emotional parting for him as he sailed away into an unknown future. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come, he wrote. Our roots are not here, they're in the kingdom. The next day they touched at Sidon, 70 miles, 112 kilometres, north of Caesarea where Julius, out of kindness, Greek philanthropia, to Paul, allowed him liberty to be refreshed, to receive attention in the revised version margin, with his friends. Paul suffered constant infirmity. After two years in prison, he would be in very poor condition, and so, as a trusted prisoner, Paul was not chained. The voyage on Paul's first day out of prison was just too much for him. His friends would include some from the preaching in Sidon brought about by scattering of the disciples to Phoenicia when persecution first broke out in Jerusalem. Paul had met them before as he passed through Sidon on his visits to Jerusalem. At that time of the year southerlies could be expected, but they encountered unseasonable northwest wind. Consequently, the voyage continued under Cyprus, that is, they sailed with the island to port, the left side, so that the mountainous island broke the force of the wind. Though necessary under the prevailing conditions, this route lengthened their journey, though some assistance would be gained from the northerly current that prevails at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. Paul surely wondered why God would delay his journey until the most dangerous time of the year for sailing. Had God got another purpose in store for him? A ship of Alexandria. And so, sailing over the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, tacking along the coast, they arrived in about fifteen days, according to tradition, at Myra one of the key cities of Lycia in southern Asia Minor. The city itself was three and a half miles, 5.6 kilometres, inland. Its port of Andreas was an important stopping point for grain ships journeying from Egypt to Rome. Myra is where St Nicholas lived at the end of the 3rd century and the beginning of the 4th. Legends grew up about him that led to him being venerated in the Netherlands as Santa Claus. In America he became known as Santa Claus. At Myra, Julius found a grain ship from Alexandria in Egypt ready to depart for Puteoli in Italy. There was a regular fleet of large grain ships sailing to and from Egypt, to supply the more than one million inhabitants of Rome who were completely reliant on imported wheat. These ships were sometimes as much as 200 feet long and 40 feet wide, with a draft of perhaps 30 feet. 
that is 60 times 12 times 9 metres. They had a large, almost square mainsail and rigged with topsails on a mast situated about the centre of the boat. An artemon, or small sail at the bow, steadied the ship, which was steered by two sweeps on each side of the stern. This vessel had evidently been delayed, but it gave the centurion an opportunity to more easily and speedily get to Rome than by continuing on foot. How strange that the apostle, who carried the true bread of life, should travel on such a ship. The winds being contrary, the journey took many days. They reached Clydus on the southwesterly point of Asia Minor, but then were forced to sail south to the island of Crete. Rounding the promontory of Salmone, a Phoenician name meaning a refuge from the wind, known today as Cape Sidoros, rounding with difficulty because of the northwest wind, they continued south of Crete and put into fair havens near the city of Lassia. Beyond this bay was Cape Matala. Had they rounded it, they would not have been able to reach the secure port of Phoenix, but rather would be driven out to sea by the full force of the wind. Crete. Crete is the fifth largest of the Mediterranean islands and stretches about 162 miles, 259 kilometres, from east to west. It has a mountain chain that reaches to over 8,000 feet, some 2,442 metres, at Mount Ida. It was part of a Roman province with Cyrene in North Africa and had a resident Jewish community. After his release from Roman captivity, Paul visited Crete and left Titus there to set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city, he says in Titus 1 verse 5. Fair Havens was not a secure harbour. Furthermore, it lacked entertainment for the soldiers and sailors so that boredom might be fatal to discipline if they stayed there through the winter months. Yet, due to the delays, sailing was now becoming dangerous. The fast of the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, in early October that year, was already past. What was to be done? It says a lot for the respect according to the Apostle that he was privy to the discussion and even allowed to put forward his opinion. He was by now, of course, an experienced traveller, and his perception that the voyage would be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship but also of our lives, was sound, though, as it turned out, their lives would be spared. Paul evidently made his observation from experience and without direction from the Spirit on this occasion. The master, that is, the pilot, steersman, or captain, and the owner of the ship were prepared to take the risk, and so the centurion decided to continue another fifty miles, eighty kilometres or so, to Phoenix, and there to winter as soon as a fair wind gave them opportunity. The centurion had his way because he was on government service. Moreover, Suetonius reported that, because of regular grain shortages in Rome, the Emperor Claudius took all possible steps to import grain even during the winter months, ensuring merchants against the loss of their ships in stormy weather, which guaranteed them a good return on their ventures. When the south wind blew softly, the sail was set and the anchor weighed. But a south wind was another danger. While it blew softly, they crept along the coast in shore, if the wind increased, they would be dashed onto the rocks. The tension grew as Paul, Luke, and all on deck anxiously watched the all-too-close and dangerous shoreline until Cape Matala was passed, and they could steer northward. Euryclidon
Suddenly the sea rippled and the ship heeled to port as a violent wind that sailors called Euroquillo burst upon them. This wind swept down the mountains to the northeast. The ship could not maintain course. It had come too suddenly for the sail to be taken in. There was nothing else that could be done other than run before the wind and hope for the best. It was a case of when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them, as Paul says in the first of Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 3. The name Euroquillo is composed of two words. The Greek Euronatus, east wind, and Latin Aquila, north wind. Luke was once criticised for inaccuracy in using this word, but a windrose found carved into an ancient pavement at Thugger in Africa has shown that Luke was using the correct term. Today this wind, which can reach hurricane force, is called a gregale. Brian Sheedy, a signalman in the Australian Navy, who spent a lot of time sailing in the Mediterranean during the Second World War, wrote, Along the length of the Mediterranean Sea, and more particularly at the eastern end, blow winds of unpredictable violence. On the seabed along that narrow sea lie thousands of ships. This in his book The War of Sea by Brian Sheedy, page 28. Acts 27 verses 14 to 44. Storm and Shipwreck Two particular lessons emerge from the story at this point. The first is that of providence. Paul had said to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, We must pass through much tribulation to enter the kingdom of God. He said this in Acts 14 verse 22. In Paul's hazardous journey, that tribulation was God's way to save 276 lives. Jesus Christ had calmed the waves for his disciples, Luke 8 verse 24, but that was not to happen this time. Consequently, an angel appeared to Paul in the midst of the storm and raging seas, and while stinging spray lashed across the deck, gave him confidence that God's hand was in it all. This was God's will. Paul could confidently remind us that God has promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We should remember this when we experience life's storms. Indeed, this writer did when, as a young brother, he was on a boat that was washed over a reef in a similar storm one night, off the west coast of Scotland. We pass through many storms in the days of our probation, but we're not forsaken. The Lord is with us, so that we are not tempted above that we are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Let us, therefore, come freely unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. No doubt, too, the centurion helped by speaking for Paul at his hearing before Caesar. The second lesson is that faith can flourish whatever the circumstances. Paul was a sick man, but believed his Lord's words, My strength is made perfect in weakness, given in the second of Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9. He says to the soldiers on board, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. He knew he would be. But then, Paul's faith was exceptional. Or was it? He too was a man subject to like passions as we are, as James says in chapter 5, verse 17. When the northeast wind hit the boat broadside, it would heel dangerously close to rolling over. Nothing could be done but turn the bows to run downwind. With such pressure on the sail and yard from the wind, it was not possible to lower them. The captain and steersman were obviously experienced, 
or the vessel may well have broached and foundered at this point. They had to wait to trim the vessel until in the lee of the dangerously rocky island of Clauder, or Corda, 23 miles 37 kilometres south of Phoenix. This island would have been reached about mid-afternoon. Here the sailors, assisted by Paul and Luke, struggled to haul the waterlogged dinghy aboard. The strain from the huge central mast with its yard and sail had started some of the timbers. Frapping with ropes strengthened the boat. This is done by passing heavy ropes over the bows and winching them tight around the midships to hold the planking firm against the ribs. The next danger was that the boat might be driven onto the notorious shoals of Greater Sirtis off the North African coast. Of these Dio Chrysostom wrote, Those who have once sailed into it find egress impossible, for shoals, cross currents and long sand bars extended a great distance out make the sea impassable or troublesome. Luke's mention of this danger means that the fear of the sailors was tangible. Everyone on board felt it. The sails were struck, that is lowered, and only a small storm sail would be set at the bows to steady the vessel as they changed course to the west. Unfortunately, a westerly course would increase the rolling of the ship. No more could be done that day as darkness overtook them. The next day the wind was still so violent that they lightened the vessel. On the third day everyone helped to cast out the tackling. This probably was to make more space below deck for the passengers. Anyone on deck was in the way of the crew and in greater danger of being washed overboard. It would be necessary to continually man the pumps. After several days the ship was a sinking hulk. No cooking had been possible, none had eaten. All were wet, shaking with cold and miserable. Below deck seasickness would be prevalent. All hope of being saved was gone, except in the mind of one man. Be of good cheer. This one man stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. This sounds rather like saying, I told you so. But we know the Apostle better than this. His statement established his credentials, so that they would believe what was to follow. He told them that the storm was not a punishment from God, but the distress was as a result of not following his advice by making the wrong decision to leave fair havens when it was too risky. He continues, Be of good cheer. These words of his Lord had been spoken to Paul when in custody in Jerusalem, mentioned in Acts 23 verse 11. There shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. Verse 22. How could he be so sure? Because an angel had stood alongside him and spoken to him earlier that very night. This was providence in action. Roman superstition would find it easy to believe that a messenger from the gods had spoken to Paul. And yes, he must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. This last statement, whilst saying none would be drowned, surely also implied that all would be converted and saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Their time on Malta would give plenty of opportunity for all to hear the word of God from his lips. At last, Paul knew why the winds had been so contrary and the voyage so distressing. It was a preparation of the hearts of those on board to thankfully receive the gospel of their Saviour, Jesus Christ. Paul concluded by saying that they must be cast upon a certain island. 
worse was to come, and they must be prepared for it. We might also note that Paul was never afraid to speak boldly and declare whose he was, nor of his faith in God's word, and the further revelation of Christ and his angels. Yet his bodily presence was weak, and his speech contemptible, in the estimation of some, we find in the second of Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. His power came from his comforter, the Lord Jesus Christ. So fourteen gruelling days passed in the Sea of Adria, which in Roman times stretched from Crete to Sicily, before the sailors sensed they were approaching land. It is thought by seamen that a boat in these conditions would drift at about one and a half miles an hour, 2.4 kilometres an hour. Corda to Malta is 476 miles, 762 kilometres so that the fourteenth day would indeed bring the boat close to the island. Soundings were taken by hand line weighted with a lead weight. The bottom of the weight was hollowed and filled with grease, so that a sample of the bottom would be obtained as well as a measure of depth. For example, if the bottom is mud, it would indicate that land was uh, quite close. When the depth was found to be 15 fathoms, 24.5 metres, and the bottom rising steeply, four anchors were cast out of the stern so that the ship's bows were still facing the unseen shore with the waves breaking over the stern. To do this, the steering sweeps would have to be removed first. Anchoring from the stern prevented the ship swinging onto the rocks of Point Cura on the northeast of Malta. The bottom there is clay, enabling the anchors to hold against the pull of the swell. Abide in the ship. Instead of waiting for daybreak, when visibility would reveal their situation, several sailors let down the small shore-going boat under pretense of casting out anchors from the bows, which would be pointless under the circumstances. Their real motive was to escape. Paul alerted the soldiers to the danger, saying, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. If the sailors abandoned ship, there would be no one to handle it and bring them all safely to shore the next day. It was a particularly heartless manoeuvre that was thwarted by the soldiers cutting the ropes so that the boat fell off, drifted away, and was lost to sight in the darkness. The crew may not have felt too bitter against Paul and the soldiers, as theirs was a desperate manoeuvre that may well have failed. None seemed to complain. But with the skiff gone, how would the non-swimmers get ashore? When in distress and danger, we may feel like taking desperate expedients, but we cannot be saved except we abide in the ecclesial ship, even with all its faults and weaknesses. Outside the ecclesia are engulfing waves and darkness. There is no answer to our problems, only hopelessness and death. The Allegory The words of a hymn, Soothe thou our voyaging over life's sea, sets the idea. Adramitium means house of death. This is where we begin life. We all take ship on life's journey as Paul's companions. At times we find winds contrary, life is difficult. But then we are baptised and enter the ecclesial ship taken out of Egypt. Despite trials we arrive at Fair Havens, our refuge in Christ. A small harbour, but better than the open sea of nations. We might seek a more secure shelter, but the Spirit can send us in a direction other than we intend. The Lord has other work for us to do, unknown trials for us to endure in faith. Euryclidon, the tempestuous spirit of nations, can toss us to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Why? 
because we find fault with our present position in Christ and seek to move to where life is more pleasant to the flesh. Such folly will bring us into storm and trouble. All experience the storms of life by which faith is tried, and by our example others are saved. Storms can come upon us so suddenly that not even the sails can be taken in. Then our ecclesial ship must be undergirded by strengthening its foundations, or leaks appear and the lives, the salvation of all are threatened by fear of quicksands and fear of rocks. Life is full of fears, but faith is not terrified, for there shall not a hair of your head perish. Paul gave himself to prayer and vigilance in practical matters. How? By lightening the ship. All loose stuff must go. Television, novel, sport, even the tackling. When we are in danger of sinking, then we get down to the bare essentials. When life itself is at stake, the true values are revealed. We suffer loss, but not of life itself, verse 23 and 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13 to 15. Angels do stand by us to strengthen us, though, unlike Paul, we may not see them. Ye must be brought before Caesar. Wouldn't we fear the prospect? But Paul rejoiced at the opportunity to preach before kings. Be of good cheer. At the point of greatest danger, at the sound of breakers and the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, then look up and lift up your heads. For your redemption draweth nigh, Christ says in Luke 21, verse 28. The depths have been taken, twenty fathoms, fifteen fathoms, signs that herald the approach of the kingdom. Do not be tempted to leave the ship for a dinghy. Stay in the ecclesial ship or all will be lost. Let us let go any sense of retreat or alternative, holiday homes, caravans, boats, etc., if they take us away from the ecclesia. The anchor seemed to hold back at the end of our voyage. Some say, My Lord delayeth his coming, in Matthew 24, verse 48. Wait for the day, verse 33. We must take spiritual meat now prepare to prepare for the final trial. All hope of profit in this life is gone at last, as the cargo of wheat is cast into the sea. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out of it. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. The first to Timothy six verse seven to eight. Our Lord is the living bread which came down from heaven. He that eateth of this bread shall live for ever. John 6, verse 51. The ship struck where two seas met, we read in verse 41. The armies of the kings of the north and the south shall meet, but we shall arrive safely to land. Where? Malta means a safe refuge, and with Christ a safe refuge is where we'll be. So let us up anchor and make our final run to the shore. Remember, we're in Christ because of the Marquess of Wellesley, with John Thomas on board, struck a sandbank in a violent storm, just like the vessel carrying our apostle to the Gentiles, 1800 years before. Paul and Christ. In a brief comparison, we note that one, both Paul and Christ became prisoners of Rome. Two, Christ calmed the sea with the words, Peace, it is I. Paul was calm in the midst of a storm because he knew Christ was with him. Three, both received angelic ministration when in great trial. Four, 
Like his Lord, Paul broke bread and encouraged others. Such is Christ's care for us also. 5. Many were saved on the ship because of the faith of one. So with the work of our Lord. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And 6. Paul could say, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the Ecclesia. Colossians 1, verse 24. They escaped all to land. Soon dawn drew on, and Paul again took the lead. After fourteen days without food, everyone was too weak to survive the ordeal ahead. He encouraged them all to take food for their health and to raise their morale. He said, There shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. This is a Hebrew idiom, which you find in first and second of Samuel and the first of Kings and Matthew 10 verse 30. Then setting an example, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Paul's example of giving thanks before all was another testimony to his faith and confidence in what God was doing. He did not resent God for the adverse circumstances into which he had fallen. Inspired by Paul's example, let us always give thanks to our God, both in private and in public, and not to be ashamed before our Lord at his coming. Whilst everyone was eating, a count was taken of the number on board. There were 276. This is a remarkable number. Not because it was so many grain ships could carry many more than that, Josephus mentions a ship that he was on carried 600 when it was wrecked in the Sea of Adria. 276, like many other New Testament numbers, is a triangular number. That is, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and so on to plus 23, when added together comes to 276. Other examples are the 153 fish, which is the triangular number of 17, 666, which is the triangular number of 36, which itself is the triangular number of 8. 120 is the triangular number of 15, which is itself a triangular number of 5. Obviously, this device is another mark of inspiration. Daylight was now upon them, and a lookout would be sent up the mast to describe what could be seen from a better vantage point. From the sea, what appeared to be a bay with a beach, the authorised version creek, offered the best hope of running aground safely before abandoning ship. It probably took most of the morning to cast enough sacks of wheat overboard to lighten the ship sufficiently for it to float higher out of the water so that it could be run closer to the shore. It would be necessary to leave some wheat in the hold as ballast, or the ship would become too unstable in the strong sea running. All purpose in the voyage was now gone. Only life itself was left to those on board, if they could be saved. When all was ready, the yard and mainsail were hoisted so that the ship could have enough headway to be steered. A foresail alone would not be sufficient. And the anchor ropes cut, abandoning the anchors on the seabed. The two steering paddles were loosed and the captain steered for the shore. All on deck would be holding their breath as the boat rushed forward. Suddenly the boat, flighting higher in the water without its cargo, swung off course. The beach where they had intended to put in could not now be reached, so they deliberately drove the bows of the ship with great force hard onto the sand of a smaller, more exposed beach. 
Waves breaking against the stern put the ship in immediate danger of breaking up. The situation was desperate. What had gone wrong? The place where two seas met was probably close to the narrow channel between the mainland and the tiny island of Salmonetta. This channel cannot be seen from seaward, but in storms the surge of water through it forms a cross-current strong enough to drive a ship to port. In recent years, archaeologists have found eight shipwrecks around Malta from the Roman period. In the panic that ensued, the soldiers decided to kill the prisoners, lest any escape and their lives be forfeit as a consequence. They forgot that Paul was a Roman citizen, and the penalty for killing him would also be severe. Julius, wishing to spare Paul, prevented the soldiers from fulfilling their purpose. And so the prisoners were unfettered and, to the wreck breaking the force of the waves, some swimming, others clinging to boards or pieces of wreckage, all escaped safely to land. It had been God's will that Paul should go to Rome. It was God's mercy that all would be saved. Paul was the central figure in the crisis. The whole epic is an outstanding story of God's providence at work.